can you think of some other examples of trade union movement women, perhaps, who had some influence and asked and made demands in this period? So I think women are increasingly moving into positions of leadership in the trade union movement during this time, and that corresponds to some huge shifts in the American economy. So the massive expansion of the public sector in the post-war era and the unionization of that sector in the 1950s and 1960s brings a lot of women into leadership positions. Sandra Feldman in the United Federation of Teachers in New York, later in the American Federation of Teachers, Lillian Roberts uh, within the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. Um, these are just a couple of people in that public sector uh, unionization movement who are very active both in organizing women who are coming into these new roles, again, largely in health, in social work, in education, uh, but then also thinking about how to translate the needs of those women into both victories in union contracts and then more broadly as part of the legislative and judicial challenges that we see in the 1970s. Talk a little bit about the new women coming into the positions. And I, I, I know you've been working on education, so give us some examples of women moving in that direction. Absolutely. So as you said, we see a huge growth of married and uh, married women and women with children in the workforce in the post-war era. And in the 1960s, the creation of new positions through uh, what we call war on poverty funding allows many women, often working class non-white women, to move into roles uh, as in education, paraprofessional educators, which we also know as teacher aides or auxiliary teachers or community teachers. And this work is, uh, in a way, it's designed to address the challenge of both heading a family and providing for that family. So these women can work often in the same schools their children attend, they work the same hours their children are at school so they can care for their children, and this work allows them to bring their own expertise in a way, their experience as heads of household, as local community activists, as connected and involved mothers, uh, what black feminists call activist mothering or community mothering. Uh, these roles allow them to bring those skills to bear and to be paid for them. And we see similar roles developed in health and social work. So through unionization, many of these women both are able to improve their living conditions, their working conditions, but also to move up within the union hierarchies. And yet, the traditional unions, the public sector unions, are they welcoming women? Do they want these uh, public sector workers who are largely female to join in? And what benefit is there to the traditional unions? Well, so I think we still have a, a sort of challenge in our conception of the American worker, and particularly the union worker in the United States. We often think of a white male industrial worker. And Today, certainly, but even then, you see during industrialization uh, the character of American workers changing, shifting drastically. And in the late 60s, early 70s, even I think well into the 1970s, the leadership of the AFL-CIO still sees their primary constituency as white, male, and industrial. And so even once they're within, working within the union movement, these women have to really push, have to really fight to be recognized, to have their issues put on the table, to push, for instance, things like maternity and um, uh, child care policies into union contracts. Uh, certain uh, cases result uh, where these contracts are challenged by public uh, municipalities saying that, in fact, this is not the kind of thing that's meant to be bargained about. And so that the, the challenge really doesn't end once these workers unionize. It begins. It just begins on a new front, in a way.